Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, as I said, my name is Cassandra Etienne. I'm Assistant Director at the Center for Cooperative Media. Um, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all to this afternoon's panel about diversifying New Jersey's legislature. Um, today's panel addresses how, despite small gains, the state government remains dominated um, primarily by white men, representing a vast majority of state senators and assembly members. Um, and what developments are happening at uh, throughout the state to help shape a legislative body that is more representative of New Jersey's communities. Um, we'll also get into how journalists can cover elections and how the press can go beyond horse race coverage to examine issues of representation um, and access to the political processes in our state. For this panel, we're joined by Sophie Nieto Munoz of the New Jersey Monitor. Um, who will speak with our guest panel about recent demographic gains and how communities are responding to underrepresentation in the state legislature. And we're also delighted to welcome Assemblywoman Ellen Park of the 37th District, um, also Assemblywoman Sadaf Jaffer of the 16th District, and Democratic strategist Laura Matos, um, partner and MAG Global Strategy Group um, LLC. On this event, for those who are not familiar, I'd like to just give a little bit of background. It's part of the Not Your Same Old Sources series. It features experts from the Diverse Sources database. It's a publicly available sortable list of experts of different races, ages, gender, ethnicity. Um, this is part of an effort to encourage reporters to expand beyond their um, Rolodex um, and, and their, in, in their reporting to engage voices that are more reflective of um, New Jersey's diverse population. Um, this panel is presented by the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University in partnership with NJ.com, um, New Jersey Ethnic and Community Media, who are well represented today among our attendees, welcome. And our event, our event span, uh, sponsor, Princeton University's Office of Communications. Thanks again to you all for joining us and we'll dive right into um, the event. Momentarily, we'll just have some brief um, announcements from my colleague, Joe Amditas. Joe? Hi, everybody. Um, Joe Amditas, uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the tech stuff. Quick note, my power is out in my building, running this on my hotspot for my phone and my laptop, uh, which is charging on my battery. So I'll get to make this quick and I'll turn it over to our wonderful guests. Um, big thing is the chat. If you have questions during our panel speaker or our speaker's uh, panel, you can put them in the chat. Just um, uh, try to make sure we're going to have uh, people watching the chat to make sure that doesn't get lost in the stream there. Um, and we will try to get to you in the order that your question was asked. If at any point during the Q&A section at the end of this event or towards the end, you'd like to just ask your question out loud or it's just not coming through on the chat as, as you want it to, you can raise your hand using the reactions feature at the bottom and you'll see a little hand raised like it is on mine. That'll help us. It'll pull you to the top of our participants list and we'll be able to see it and call on you. We will be sharing <clears throat> a recorded version of today's meeting. We are recording right now. We'll also be sharing a uh, an auto-generated transcript using Otter and all of that, including any additional links and resources shared by the assembly women or our, our speakers or our host today will be shared via email to everyone who registered on Eventbrite uh, as soon as the recording and the transcript are done processing uh, on Zoom and Otter respectively. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to our gracious host, Sophie Nieto Munoz. Go ahead and take it away, Sophie. And I'm just gonna spotlight the rest of our guests as well for the time being. So thank you, Sophie, and thank you to our guests. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'll just do like a quick introduction of myself and then if everyone wants to, um, I don't know, go around and, and introduce themselves. My name is Sophie, I'm a reporter with the, the um, New Jersey Monitor. And before this, I was a reporter with NJ.com and I cover a, like a little bit of everything, um, but I do focus a lot of my efforts on diversity and um, talking to diverse communities in my reporting. Um, I don't know if like Laura or assembly members, if you want to um, say a little bit about who you are, but my, my first question um, for the assembly members, which will kind of go into the introduction, um, is kind of about what drove you or inspired you to run for office. Um, is this something that you saw yourself doing or if not, kind of what was the turning point that made you want to run? Uh, should I start? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, I, hi everyone. Um, I, I'm Assemblywoman Ellen Park of District 37. 
Um, I, uh, I am Korean, uh, but I, and um, I live in Anglo Cliffs. And I think as far as going to politics, uh, I think for me, uh, it's sort of a natural progression. Um, I went, I'm an attorney, uh, you know, when I went to law school is really when things started clicking um, because I ran a voter's registration drive in Flushing. Um, this is 95, uh, 96, right? It was a Clinton um, re-election. And I remember like standing outside in the freezing cold for two days and I could only get two people to register the entire time. And I don't know if you've ever been to Flushing. There's like millions of people living in Flushing. So that was, you know, sort of a, a, an eye opener um, as to why Asians uh, don't really uh, vote. Um, and I think it sort of kind of progressed from there. And I was also a councilwoman uh, for one term in Angle Cliffs. And I think once you kind of step into local politics, it leads to other uh, possible higher offices. And I think for me, like I said, I think it's just sort of a natural progression, but really I think, you know, it's the lack of representation. Um, that was really the, the background of it is that, you know, we really definitely need more women and uh, more women of color uh, to, uh, you know, be down in Trenton. So that's why I'm here. Hi. Uh, so I think for me, my undergraduate degree was in international affairs, and I had always thought about working for the government, potentially as a diplomat or something like that. And I was interested in advocacy issues like human rights, um, but it was really George Bush's reelection that motivated me because everyone I knew was sure he was going to lose. And uh, when he won, I felt a sense of responsibility. I felt guilty. I hadn't done anything. Um, it, you know, to get out the vote or anything like that. And so it was President Obama's campaigns, uh, his first campaign, and then his reelection campaign, where I actually started doing canvassing, calling voters, and organizing through South Asians for Obama. Um, and that's, you know, and I felt a piece of that victory. And I think it's kind of thrilling when you participate in a campaign and your candidate wins. And, um, and then I was very disappointed with uh, some of my elected officials. And I started to think that there needed to be more people like me who were the decision makers uh, because I would call their offices. And I knew no matter how many times I called, they were gonna make the judgment based on their values, based on what was important to them. And I started to feel like it, it, we needed more people like myself with my values, with my perspective in elected office. And that's what motivated me to think about running um, and I, uh, whenever I have an idea, I start just talking about it. And someone told me about the Emerge program, which is for women from the Democratic Party who want to run for office. And it was just starting in New Jersey. And I did that program. And I think that was really helpful. Or it's always helpful for underrepresented communities to have formal training and mentorship programs. Um, and so I was actually campaigning for someone for Congress when I was asked to run for local office. And that's kind of the start of my journey. Awesome. Um, so my next question is kind of about what, once you got into uh, the legislature, um, you both were the first woman, first Muslim woman and first East Asian woman to enter the legislature. So I'm wondering if you saw any glaring gaps that you were able to fill either by proposing legislation or actually getting something you know passed. And was there anything that you were like, whoa, I can't believe that this has been overlooked this entire time. Um, so I don't know if Sadaf, you want me to start next, I guess. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, there's definitely, again, you know, the fact that I'm the first East Asian woman, uh, it opens the doors for, um, you know, various different opportunities for the East Asian community. Um, you know, what I have on right now is a uh, kimchi day bill. Um, that's probably going to be also passed in the Senate, um, recognizing that, you know, just uh, November 22nd is kimchi day, what kimchi means to us Koreans, uh, Korean Americans, you know, it's not just about, you know, our, our uh, everyday, um, you know, intake of kimchi, right? It's not just a staple of our, of our meals, but also, you know, it, there's, there's tradition and culture behind kimchi, right? In the process of making kimchi. So, 
you know, the fact that that is on the floor, I think says a lot. Um, and, you know, I, and as the first East Asian uh, woman in the assembly for District 37, um, we do have uh, a lot of uh, Koreans here. And the fact that there are all these different kinds of uh, Korean non-for-profits and they've never asked uh, the state of New Jersey for any kind of funding, any kind of assistance, um, you know, I, I don't know whether they knew to ask their assemblymen or assemblywomen or the fact that I am Korean, they could relate and they feel comfortable coming to me and asking me for assistance or, you know, helping them uh, get assistance from the state. It was the first time uh, the Korean Community Center in Channel Fly was able to uh, receive uh, some assistance as well as uh, the Korean American uh, Association of New Jersey. So, I, you know, again, it's just like letting, you know, everybody know, our constituents know um, that representation matters. You know, there's only one East Asian woman um, or, you know, East Asian uh, in man or woman, right? Um, in, in down in the assembly and Senate. The fact that if we have two or three, that will change also, right? The, and then it gives perspective as to what more representation will mean for us. So um, I think uh, it's definitely the beginning of a really great start for our community. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I have some legislation that I'm you know, supporting that is about translation uh, of materials and government documents for the commonly spoken languages. Um, I think it's really just about people feeling like they can ask for help or even knowing what state government does or is um, and if they need help with their on insurance uh, with their unemployment uh, claims or anything like that they might not even know that their state legislators can help them with things like that and so um, that's been really meaningful to me um, and to hear from members of the immigrant community of some challenges they face for example having to pay international student tuition at Rutgers, even if they, you know, have been living in the US for so long and been taxpayers. And I think these stories or these experiences can fall through the cracks if people don't see representatives who they relate to and that they feel comfortable approaching. So that's been really meaningful for me. And similarly, uh, just a lot of my interns in my office have been you know, young people from uh, Asian American community who you know, seeing me then think, oh, well, maybe this is a field I could go into. Um, and similarly, I think with staffing, um, I've been really proud to hire. Um, I, I've always had all women staff um, and uh, many women of color from different backgrounds as well. So kind of building that pipeline of uh, professionals in government uh, from diverse communities as well. Awesome. Um, so New Jersey is obviously no stranger to gatekeeping politics when it comes to down ballot um, party bosses, just political, powerful political players that kind of never go away. Um, we also see that faith in government is dropping. There was a Monmouth poll released this week that said, I think it was 79% of New Jerseyans think the federal government is doing a fair or poor job and 66% uh, said the same of the New Jersey government. So I'm curious kind of how you get, um, how do you recruit people to run in the legislature or to get involved in politics? Um, and also how do you get them to stay in office or stay involved in politics? And Laura, feel free to, free to jump in, please. Um, well, I, I will. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for having me um, jump in here. You know, I am not um, I am not one of the brave souls who um, is putting my name on a ballot. Um, so speaking from a different perspective um, than than the uh, Assemblywoman, um, you know, I think Assemblywoman Park um, really um, hit it on the head. I think it it starts with activism and, and finding something Thing that you care about passionately and getting involved in your local community and Assemblywoman Jaffer as well. Um, you know, Assemblywoman Jaffer, I think you talked about it more from a getting involved in politics and government and volunteering on, on campaigns. 
Um, you know, I think folks recognizing it, it doesn't necessarily, it, it can be more of a civic engagement um, on a local level and, you know, recognizing, again, what you care about, what your values are and what you're passionate about and getting involved on a community level. And that's kind of, you know, how um, candidates for office are identified. Um, school board, local council, um, you know, mayors, uh, county offices, and, and the legislature. Um, and I think that part of the reason we're starting to see more diversity reflected in the legislature um, is partly because of, um, you know, uh, the, the diversity of um, specifically women and women of color getting involved in their local communities and, and being vocal and passionate about the things that they care about. Um, and, you know, building that sense of community and recognizing that they can continue, they can continue to grow that um, and, and take it to the next level. <laughs> yeah, I, I have some thoughts on this. So um, I think that I, when I started going into politics, a lot of people would ask me, like, why would you do that? <laughs> um, why would you take time away from academia, which is this kind of very highfalutin kind of place and, and go be in politics, which is this messy, dirty thing. Um, and actually when I got involved with Emerge, and I remember, I think the first session was a panel of women elected officials and I was so inspired by them. And I felt like they were real people and that they were they were authentic to themselves. They weren't putting on a show and they really cared about their communities. And I think I, I this is, you know, something I would challenge the media to do. Like, it's good to cover the controversies. It's good to cover, you know, whatever that's taking place that might be negative. But if that's all the public hears, then, yeah, they're not going to think that there's worth getting involved we do need to hear about the all the good work that's being done. And, you know, I would say for the people that I know who are not involved in politics, they have no idea about what the state legislature is doing. And I'll tell them, you know, we've passed lots of legislation on gun safety, on reproductive rights, on, you know, getting school lunches to children, all sorts of really great things for the community, but they're not hearing about it. And so, I think we need that balance in the in the reporting that we have about government, where it's not just about the gossipy sort of this person versus that person and this person hates that person, which, yeah, it's there, but um, there's a lot more there. I think that that would actually really help for people to see why it's relevant, because even with my students, um, you know, at Princeton, a lot of times they're like, oh, everything's just terrible and there's no point getting involved and I kind of can tell them from my perspective that that's not true. Here's all the things I've been able to do and I'm just one person. So if all of us kind of contributed and tried, we could, we could improve things. And honestly, there's a lot of good work being done. Absolutely. Um, I agree with you hundred um, percent. And, you know, it's always like, you know, as a parent, I joined a PTA, you know, how active was I? I tried as much as I could. I'm a working mom. You know, it just takes everybody to do a little bit um, as a community and we could do so much together. And, you know, I have, um, you know, residents in my town who are like, oh, you know, do you think I could run for council? You know, I, I'm not a lawyer. That's the first thing they say. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I don't really have much experience. But I said, if you have the drive and the heart to do what you feel that is important to you at, on certain issues, like absolutely nobody cares that you don't have experience. Um, you know, they can see that you're a very hard worker because they're also involved in the PTA or Little League or, you know, everybody knows on a local level who is very active in the town. And I always tell them like, if you want to go into, you know, local politics and be a council member, that would be a great start or even Board of Ed would be a great start. And you know, and my motto is if I, if I don't, if I won't do it for myself, like I won't ask someone else to do it. Right. Like anything I do, I'm comfortable with asking and, and also um, sharing or participating. So, you know, um, I always try to push um, others to join um, on a local level. Uh, we, in Angle Coast, we have a new Korean American um, council member who's, uh, you know, that I'm, very familiar with and friends with um and you know it's always about keeping it going right it's not just about 
the only East Asian member in Trenton. We want, we want more. So, and how do we get more and how do we get them to stay? Well, you know, more is me actively going out there and seeking others to get more involved, you know? Um, and, you know, you know, from our, our you know, uh, communications or contact that there are people out there that are, are interested and it's, it's sort of my uh, role as a state assembly person, the first East Asian to go and help them get to, you know, either council or board of ed um, in local politics. And then the other is, you know, I am a working mom. Um, you know, I work for corporate and I have the polit you know, I'm, I'm also down in Trenton four times a month. Like it's about juggling. Right. And I think that's been the hardest, uh, you know, the hardest thing that I have to still get used to, right. Is trying to juggle everything and balance, you know, work, life, politics, and everything else. So I always rely on my friends, I rely on my staff, I rely on everyone um, so that I don't lose my head. And I'm very, like, knock on wood, I'm very thankful I have that support. But for any other women who are going to, you know, join and become, you know, involved in politics, I think that that will be the hardest thing that you will have to uh, get over is the balancing act. Um, so, you know, I'm always here if anybody has any, um, you know, questions about, but having a calendar or multi multiple calendars, I could tell you is like saved me from um, missing out on some stuff, so. I, I do want to um, touch on what Assemblywoman Jaffer said about the press, but uh, really quickly, I, I want to bounce off of what Assemblywoman Park just said, you know, you're a working mom, um, you're the first uh, Korean American woman, East Asian, period, in the legislature, and you, you just said that you would have to go out and, you know, put this effort in to recruit more people, and to me, um, that kind of sounds like a woman of color shouldering a lot of the of a burden, dare I say that word. Um, so, I mean, how do you feel supported by your party or, or I guess how, how do you get that support to make sure that you're not just doing it alone, you're not burnt out? And also what does that support look like outside of politics? I'm curious. And that's for anybody also. Um, so, you know, obviously politically, I, this is my second year going, right? Um, and I learned in the last year that you really need to um, be close with your community, uh, be close with certain organizations that support you to kind of, you know, uh, put things together, events together or rally, um, just kind of get the word out, right? Um, and there's no way you could do it alone. Absolutely not. Um, and if I ever felt that it was just me, I, I, I don't know that I would continue to be honest because, you know, what I do um, is not just for me, right? Um, it's for everyone. We, we, if, you know, I, when, I, when I used to practice law, I used to tell my clients, like, if you do well, right, that means I'm going to do well. So I always push for the better of the community, right? Um, and so uh, I'm very thankful uh, in that sense is that I, the Korean community here in District 37 has been really supportive. Um, you know, I, I did get a little bit of, uh, I guess in the beginning, I, I get, there were, I guess, several other uh, Korean American politicians that have come and gone. And so there's been a bit of a comparison in the beginning and I had to basically tell them like, you can't compare me. Like I'm, I am who I am. And, you know, don't think I'm some other person, right? And that was sort of a hurdle in the beginning, but, you know, for the last year, they've been super supportive. Um, and, you know, I'm very thankful that I have that. Um, and then as far as home, uh, my kids, I, they're 16 and 13. So, you know, they're older, um, but still, you know, they're going through right now, um, high school admissions, college admissions. It's a lot of driving back and forth all the time. And, um, luckily, my husband and I work part time from home now after COVID. So, you know, we're able to have a schedule where if I can't do it, he can do it and vice versa. But, you know, they're, they're proud of me and I'm, I'm getting their support. But again, it's just a day to day thing. Like, I need to get over today. I need to get over this week. I need to get over the month. And maybe that's just gonna, how it's going to be for a while. But as long as I have the support, um, you know, from, from my constituents and as well as home, I think 
I can, I can uh, keep going. So I'm very happy and thankful for that. And I think something too, that Assemblywoman Jaffer said earlier, you know, and I would assume um, Assemblywoman Park, you, you, you alluded to this too. So I think you agree, um, you know, the staff, um, uh, really, I think is uh, a very important piece of this whole discussion as well, because while, um, you know, the, the elected officials are the show and, and, you know, they're again, the ones who are, um, brave enough to, to put their names on the ballot and go out and, and spend that time away from their families with their constituents and, and, uh, you know, doing all of, um, the community work and, and behind the scenes work that goes along with being elected. Um, you know, the staff folks, uh, the, the diversity of the staff teams is, is very important, um, you know, because they're, um, I think really in the weeds and, and doing the work on some of the policy making, you know, the, the, the elected officials are, um, you know, driving the, the train, so to speak, but the staff are really in the weeds and, and supporting that work and helping to keep those trains running on time. Um, and <clears throat> in terms of recognizing that representation shows uh, different communities, the, the shared values, um, and, and understanding um, of their elected officials, I think the staff um, is a big part of that as well. Because you know, when it when it comes down to it, any person who it has a seat at a table where policy making is taking place, they need to um, look like and um, understand uh, the people that those policies will affect. Um, and so in addition to the elected officials, the, the staff and the folks working with them, the diversity in those uh, teams is, is very important as well. Yeah, I'm proud to say both uh, Sadaf and I have women as our chief of staff. So again, it's, you know, trying to keep that going. Right. And you guys can't be everywhere at once. Right. So so having that representation and and the, the your communities understanding that you that matters to you and, and that your culture and heritage and, and the representation is important to you is um, is really a critical piece of it as well. Great, thank you. Um, so to touch back on the press again, um, you know, I know that we have a lot of um, ethnic and community media on today, which I'm really happy to see. But unfortunately, our state house press corps, or what the governor's office definitely views as a state house press corps, is overwhelmingly white. Um, so while we work to diversify that on our end, I'm curious, uh, what are some of the biggest gaps that you see, um, whether that's stories that, you know, gaps in terms of reporters not going out into communities or uh, relying too much on, I don't know, social media. Um, how, how can reporters be helping to improve um, the diversity of our readership, the diversity of who's involved in politics, uh, which in turn diversifies the legislature? Sarah, why don't you start? I think you have to start from point zero in the sense that so many members of the public just don't even know how many districts there are, you know, what a state assembly person is, what the legislature is, how does a bill go through? Like, I think we just need a lot of education, you know, on all of these matters and how to contact someone, who to contact if you have a concern. Um, we got to make government feel closer to the public because I think the public feels like this is something that's far away, that's done by other people for other people, has nothing to do with me. And so I want to see the public feel empowered. Like, no, this is just me. This is a neighbor who's representing me, but I have full right to access them, but also see, see our humanity, <laughs> you know, see that we are just your neighbors trying to represent you. We're not like some sort of otherworldly figures. Um, and I think the more relatable the public sees elected officials, then they'll feel more comfortable perhaps even thinking about stepping up and doing it. Because, oh, yeah, this is just a, a person with a family and they just cared about X, Y, Z issue and they stepped up. So maybe I should step up, too. Um, I think, you know, featuring the work and the stories of 
local electeds, you know, school board members, things like that. Like, I almost feel like a lot of political reporting in New Jersey is kind of like that, the big man story of history. It's like the big man story of New Jersey politics. Like, let's just keep talking about the same three people or something, um, but not really all these others who have great ideas and have different experiences and um, kind of getting that rich picture of what's going on. I think, I think that's right. Um, I, um, you know, I do think that um, it's, it's tough. It's a tough environment for journalists um, because I think there is such a focus on kind of, uh, you know, clicks and, and what's sexy um, and good news of who's doing good work that helps people um, is not really viewed as sexy a lot of the time, um, but it's important. Um, and I think local media um, is is a big piece of that, um, you know, not on, on the positive side of anything at all. But if you look at um, the, the George Santos stuff um, coming you know, that's all the news um, that's coming about him. A lot of that was actually broken in local press um, during the election season and just didn't really get any traction. There are good local journalists um, that are that are doing the work and it's just hard to get people to pay attention again because it's not necessarily viewed as sexy. So I think it's, you know, amplifying and, and working in smaller communities to amplify that good news and, and teaching about the good work that um, elected officials and appointed officials are doing on every level. Um, you know, it's, excuse me. Um, you know, I think that's, that's a good starting point because I think it is harder to start on Sophie, like you said, a larger level of, you know, looking at the, the bigger picture of government and politics in New Jersey from that kind of state house press corps. Um, but there are, you know, the local and, and um, other uh, hyper local media outlets um, and journalists that can help to start doing that, that can kind of help feed um, some of that other journalism. Excuse me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with both of you, all, all of you. Um, you know, I think it's just do our constituents see us relatable, right? Like, are, are we like them or are we, you know, complete? you know, somebody very foreign, right? And so um, it's true that, you know, there's sensationalism in the press and that's not gonna be good news. It's always something bad. And, you know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with District 37 or where I live is Angle Cliffs. We're always in the news because it's always crazy here locally and it's never good if we're on the news. So uh, I just find that very uh, interesting and also, um, you know, it's not a good thing. But as far as, you know, what I've been doing um, with, I guess, the foreign press or Korean press is that anytime, you know, if there's a new program or incentive um, that we <clears throat> get from Trenton saying, you know, like, for instance, the, the anchor program has now been uh, uh, post pushed back so you can get all your paperwork in by end of February, right? So we've been sending those kinds of notifications to the Korean media so they could send it out in their... Um, in their publication, right? Um, and just, you know, we just started a uh, cacao talk group, which is sort of like WhatsApp. Um, but, you know, because then we can get the information out quicker. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm trying to work uh, so that I can, I'm trying to work uh, so that it's faster for the information to get released without, because what happens is when we send the media, when we send all this information to the media, we send it constantly, right? they pick and choose what they want to publish for that day. Um, but at least with the cacao talk, like it'll just be what we need to get out and it'll be instant. So, um, you know, there, there are other ways, but it would be really uh, helpful for us, for uh, elected officials, if maybe somebody would ask like, hey, how can we get the word out to our, uh, to your constituents or how can we help the community in, in such a way? Um, and I think, Again, because it's, you know, we live in a very diverse um, state and there's, you know, this Lunar New Year this weekend. I don't know if people are aware, <laughs> but uh, um, we are aware up here. Um, kids have half a day and, uh, and, and there's, you know, lots of activities. Um, 
and this weekend will be full of activities. And I think next weekend is the Montclair API is going to have a uh, Lunar New Year event. So, you know, again, it's just getting, getting out these events and, you know, letting others know that this is happening in their community. Um, and that if they would like to participate, it's great, it's free, um, and it's getting to know your neighbors, right? So um, it's just a very constant feed of news and hopefully um, the media can help um, not, and not pick and choose the sensational ones, but you know, get the ones out that needs to go out as well. Great, thank you. Um, so this is gonna be our, our last question before we move on to the Q and A portion. I know some people already have their hand raised. Um, so my last question, how can the press uh, do a better job of covering these stories and what efforts can, can the press do to improve diverse representation um, at the state level? I think, I mean, I think this effort, you know, the, the, um, that we're participating mm -hmm. in is a really good start. Um, the diverse sources database, I think, um, is a really exceptional idea. Um, and I have, um, you know, I, from what I can see, um, reporters are really taking advantage of it, um, and using it, um, which I think is great. Um, and I think that's, um, where it starts because it's not just about, sources for a story here or there. It's how relationships get developed and, um, you know, how um, these stories start getting told on, on a broader level. So I really think that a good first step is this database and, and these outreach efforts um, to educate folks about, um, you know, some of these diverse leaders that exist at all different levels of government and politics and policy and civics um, in New Jersey and starting to broaden um, the kind of the, the horizons that are out there um, to really allow for some of these stories. And, and you know, we, we're, we use the word diversity a lot, um, but it's really, you know, New Jersey's almost a majority minority state. So it, it's really, you know, showing the fabric of, of our state um, because we do have such a rich patchwork of different cultures and values and traditions and, um, you know, countries of origin and, and so much that so many people bring um, that it's really a great first step in, in um, you know, amplifying those voices and, and letting those stories be told. I would say um, maybe, maybe the diverse legislators are less good at bragging about ourselves. It's possible. Um, but maybe, you know, check in with, with our offices. Like, what are you working on this month? Uh, you know, what's, what's important to your constituents? What have people been reaching out about? Um, and, you know, it's like, you know, I know in academia, there's this whole thing about not having all male panels and like, you know, let, you know, are we getting work that's being done from, you know, people who maybe we don't hear about as much? Um, I think that, that that's, you know, just something that comes to mind. Um, and then I think, you know, for me, uh, maybe talking about our challenges in, you know, our challenges in politics, uh, because it, I think we do face different challenges. And I don't think people who have, you know, white privilege or male privilege, maybe they've just never heard the things that we face. And it's surprising to me sometimes when I tell people, like, yeah, you know, my opponents, uh, you know, have a website that says I'm a radical and, you know, that I, I'm an extremist and things like that. And they're like, what? Like, I, I had no idea that you would face that. And so I think talking about it will help people maybe understand the challenges that we face a little bit better. And I think too, you know, um, going back to the kind of, the point of things that the media can do and journalists can do. I think also, you know, calling out some of this stuff when when you see it, you know, you see articles um, uh, about kind of the political process in New Jersey and and things like that, and you know, um, the the primaries and um, the process of selecting candidates. Um, and you know, a lot of times when th those types of things are talked about. 
Um, it's, you know, names that are put out there and, and ideas that are put forth that are all white men. Um, and, you know, um, pointing that out sometimes, um, I think would, would, um, be helpful because I mean, it's, it's the first thing I look at, you know, when there's articles and, you know, I look at who was interviewed and quoted or who were, you know, who was named and it's, it's things that I notice it. Um, and I'm sure that if, um, I do others do as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's starting at the local level, you know, get to know your uh, councilman, your board of ed um, members, you know, and just kind of starts from there, right? And as far as in the state level, I mean, I I, I think thus far, I, I think I'm getting good press, <laughs> um, but, you know, I rely, I rely on, you know, my, my chief of staff and I have an outreach director who's Korean American. He's probably the only Korean American staffer ever. Um, but, you know, it's getting the other, your constituents more involved where they actually, you know, if someone says something about me to the media, which, you know, happens as well, or she's not, you know, not happy with me or they have a complaint. There's always people out there that support you and say, no, you, you know, it's a misunderstanding or you don't understand the situation, whatever it is, is just, you know, again, having people feel that they like, you know, I'm just a neighbor or I'm just a friend as opposed to, oh, I'm a state assembly woman, you know, like I'm, I'm relatable. So, um, yeah, and whatever, you know, whatever I can do, um, you know, as your neighbor, as your state assembly woman, I'm here to, to help. So. Um, and again, it's always, we're always putting out there our office number, our office address, you know, our, when hours of business. Um, so that is a constant thing that we send out to, to everyone when we can, like to the local, you know, local, I'll reach out to the local uh, schools, you know, let the, let the principals know that there is, you know, an event here for, uh, you know, let's say there's a lunar year event or there is a specific event for, I'm sorry, a specific group of kids, you know, it's always just getting that information out quickly has been uh, a challenge and it's been my goal for the last year. So um, I'm very fortunate that I have staff um, who deal with that on a daily basis. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for answering my questions. Um, we're gonna move on to the Q and A. Um, so our first question will be um, Clyde Hughes, and then after that we'll have Mo Sinzi here. So Clyde, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, 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 great. I have a couple of questions. I I won't try to get this too uh, too bogged down. Uh, uh, glad to see uh, Laura Matos uh, on the pan panel. Big fan of Lat Latina Civic. Uh, one of the things that they they are doing, uh, they have held workshops to engage other Latinas to run for office. And they're currently doing a, a number of things uh, to encourage uh uh, Lat Lat Latinas to, 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 to get involved, uh, get on boards, and also run for office to increase those numbers. I would like to ask, uh, uh, Laura, how do you think your uh, that effort with Latina Civic is going? And also, uh, to the other panelists, do you think it would be beneficial uh, to have a grassroots organization like that uh, to help build up uh, numbers in the Asian community, uh, uh, in, in the Muslim community, and so on. Thank you so much, Clyde, for, for those kind words. Um, yes, Latina Civic, we have, um, we started at the end of last year doing a local county-based uh, meet and greet um, uh, events where we engage uh, Latinas that we know um, and, and currently work with and task them with inviting uh, other Latinas that they know who are civically engaged or engaged in the community to come and just meet us and learn, you know, the types of things that we do um, just in terms of our uh, advocacy and work um, on a statewide level uh, to uh, get Latinas civically um, engaged and, and running for office. 
Um, it's been going very well, knock on wood. Um, and we're really getting um, a, a very, very good response. Um, and, you know, we're pleased we have uh, events set up over the next six months across the state. Um, and that's, you know, one piece of what we're doing. And it's, um, again, you know, I think we've talked a lot about our connections in our communities um, and, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, empowering those folks to go out and, and do some of this work and recognize that they have that power and that ability um, is, is a really, uh, is really cool. And it's, it's really fun. Um, and I think, you know, um, it's the, the grassroots piece of it. Um, we're really seeing success, um, you know, again, coming out of the last number of years, uh, politically in this country. Um, I think it's really kickstarted a lot of activism, um, and, you know, helping to harness that, um, and just another little plug, I know Assemblywoman Jaffer mentioned Emerge, uh, the Center for American Women in Politics has a, a program um, in March. It's called Ready to Run. Um, and they do have some um, specific programming aimed at um, Asian Americans, African Americans, and Latinas um, who are interested in running for office. Um, so, you know, if uh, that's uh, something that folks can share within their communities. That is a stepping stone to help network and meet people and also learn about what goes into uh, running for office and um, you know, working on campaigns and, and uh, other, uh, other activities uh, in and around your community. Okay, um, next we have Mohsin and after that we have uh, Jay Young Kim. Hi. Uh can you can you hear no. me there you go you're no. good yeah all now right. we can all hear right. you all right uh, this is Mohsin Zahir from Urdu News I have a question for Sadaf Jafar Assemblywoman you are and uh, I believe still you were, were and still I believe you are an inspiration to a lot of Pakistani South Asian and other immigrant communities to run for office and to be part of mainstream America. But uh, at this time, when a lot of people have inspiration, you have decided not to run for the next term. So what would you say to your voters and to supporters and to your community? And you know well that in New Jersey, every day, the Pakistani community is growing and growing. And my other question is to, uh, uh, the other panelists uh, also. So what is your experience? Uh, what is the biggest challenge to ensure more and more voting turnout in immigrant communities? Thank you so much for your question. I think, um, you know, the most basic uh, response to that is that we are elected officials, but we're human beings first. And we have responsibilities to our families, to ourselves. Um, and I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing a lot more leaders from our communities rise up, but um, it's, it's a very unique burden to bear as a representational figure. And it's something that, you know, I experienced when I was mayor, being the first Muslim woman mayor, and uh, now in the legislature as well. And it's, it's exhausting, uh, just to be completely honest with you. And, you know, now all of us have to just take stock of how much we can do at any given time. Um, and I often think about this, uh, you know, metaphor that I think it's like many hands make for light work. Like if people, if there were more of us participating, then it wouldn't be such a heavy burden for just a few of us to, to bear. And so how is it, how can we get that critical mass? And, um, you know, in response to one of the earlier questions, there is actually an organization that I was one of the founders of called ISA, Inspiring South Asian American Women. We actually have an event this weekend uh, to celebrate all the South Asian American women electeds uh, throughout New Jersey. And it started off as just a brunch group of women who were involved and then it formalized into an organization. Um, so we are definitely working to build that bench. And in those few short years, we've seen 
just exponential growth of representation on, you know, city councils, on school boards. And so I think it's really promising. Um, when I was thinking about running for legislature and people approached me and, and told me to think about it, I actually went to the website of the Center for American Women in Politics and I looked at their timeline of women in politics as I wanted to see who the first Asian American woman was. And I was absolutely shocked when there hadn't been one. And that motivated me, but we have three. So we're making progress. Um, Assemblywoman Park, you're on mute. So my other question was, what do you think uh, anybody can answer is the biggest challenge to ensure more and more uh, voting turnout in immigrant communities? I mean, I, I, again, it's getting the word out, making sure that, you know, they know when to vote, how to vote. Um, if they have certain language barriers, we should definitely make it easier for them to vote. Um, me personally, uh, this year, I even offered to, you know, uh, you know, have certain organizations or not that I offer, organizations are going to uh, assist in, uh, you know, voter turnout. So again, I, you know, I, I totally understand what Sadaf was saying and, you know, uh, my hat is to you. I, I'm gonna miss you so much <laughs> down the assembly, she knows. Um, but it is really, really difficult, um, just the balancing. And, you know, we really need a support system and we ask the, our constituents to be a you know, support system, right? Like, mm -hmm. the, well, you know, the more people you should be able to rely on um, to help you. And, um, you know, I, I think that will ensure the bigger, biggest voter turnout, right? Is going to all of our uh, uh, organizations that support us to make sure that they have on their roster what they need to do on our behalf, um, so. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, oh, Jay Young, you're already here, perfect. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I, ha I actually have a couple of questions. First question I have is for the uh, representative uh, Park. So you mentioned, and I want to piggyback on the uh, previous question as well. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, you know thousands of people living in Flushing, and I also am living in Flushing as well. Um, as a resident uh, of Flushing, and, and I see a lot of students and immigrants um, who are living in this community who wish to be part of the leadership roles and who wish to be you know uh, become an elected official, but also who wish to become a voter. Um, do you have any uh, any further step, future step that you would like to take, um, you know, to support the Dream Act that was uh, that was actually presented last year, two thousand and twenty one, uh, and now you know a lot of students are actually have obtained their status as DACA, the Deferred Action for the Children um, Arrivals. But these students are still struggling. These Im immigrants are still struggling. In, in order for us to gain more voice, gain more voters, we need to help them. So what are what are the administration actions that you are going to take in order to help them? And also the second question, I'll, I'll go on the second question after you answer, I guess. Um, so obviously those are federal issues, but whatever we can do in the state level. I mean, ultimately, I did send the letter um, with my... Uh, fellow colleagues uh, to President Biden about possible, you know, another amnesty. Um, you know, there was, President Reagan is the one who did the last amnesty. And that's how a lot of my uh, family members and friends were able to get their green cards at that time. So I think it's definitely necessary. It's been, you know, 30 plus years. So um, that is, you know, what I did and that's what I plan to do. Of course, we support that. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, and then, but, be, you know, I support that, I've sent the letter, but on the state level though, right? Like we're, we need to register as many, uh, you know, uh, people who can actually vote, right? And if you look at the Korean population, right? There's about a hundred thousand Koreans uh, in, in Jersey, right? Um, out of those, how many actually vote? It's still like five to 6%, right? It's very, very low numbers. Right, and I, I don't think all hundred thousand you know can't vote. Right, <laughs> they're they're registered voters. Right, so I think on a state level we really need to push uh, 
our um, community to go and register and actually vote. Uh, if I may, if I want to, uh, if I can uh, ask you the second question I have is, I know you actually uh, supported and sponsored the bill uh, AJR 201 uh, for the uh, Lunar New Year in New Jersey area. Um, so, and also in New York and New York State has, you know, stated that they will be now uh, honoring uh, Lunar New Year as one of the uh, holiday. Now, uh, the legislator, um, Representative Grace Mank from the 6th District, she actually uh, proposed a bill uh, to to make it as a, a federal holiday. Um, is there any further step that you are going to take? Because, you know, a lot of uh, now students and also the parents are asking why some of the Lunar New Year, they're, they're not going to school, but some Lunar New Year's, they are going to school. And actually they, they answer that question as being that it's not being honored as a federal holiday because it is a uh, non-federal holiday, they can't uh, serve as an observed holiday on Monday. So is there any further steps or are you going to, uh, are you, do you have any further steps that you're going to support this bill uh, in the future? Oh, well, I, obviously I'm the sponsor of the bill, so I'm going to support the bill, right? But, um, you know, yes, everything is from a local level, then a state level and a federal level, right? Same thing for Kimchi Day. I think there are like six states that have Kimchi Day, right? Um, and New Jersey now being one of those. Uh, states, but then also um, Andy Kim and others down in, in uh, uh, Congress actually passed a or passing a federal Kimchi Day resolution, right? So it goes up the ladder for sure. Um, but you know, I think again, it's you know those things are all great, but we really need to have civic engagement um, and just really press the civic engagement um, within our community. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. And uh, Joe said that all the unanswered questions will be sent to our speakers and their offices will give answers and then those will be distributed. Um, so Calandria, take it away. Thank you. I do apologize for having uh, my camera off. Um, I have my kids running in and out my room and my face doesn't look quite good when they are present. Um, my question is like, when it comes to diversity, how do we see um, the state of New Jersey in diversity in comparison with um, the federal Congress? And also, um, I have the question, uh, another question for Laura Matos. In, in those training um, where um, you engage uh, Latinos and people of color in, in in exploring um, politics, um, it is discussed the, um, the wages that the politician have. And I ask that because we know, I mean, I know they, they tend to work um, low, um, what is called um, part-time or something. And also their salary may not be as, as high as we may see or as we may ideal, I like think. Um, and also based on um, people of color, we know that they, uh, we, because I am a person of color, an immigrant, um, tend to have um, low wages job. And then that may put us in a position on how we actually can uh, meet the needs for our families. And, um, and also then it put us in a position against senior politicians who may be lawyers, like white male lawyers for a long time, doctors, and I don't know. So yes, those are my questions. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that we have not um, talked about today um, is, is that very real um, consideration um, of, of money and, you know, whether it be campaign finance or, you know, like Assemblywoman Park was talking about, when you're looking at making that commitment to public service, how can you, how can you do that work that, that is important for your community and balance the, your, the rest of your personal life? be it your family or your profession or all of it. Um, and that is a, a real consideration um, that, you know, I wish, 
I wish I had an answer to, um, but it's something that needs to be in the discussion and needs to be in the discourse um, because it is very important for, you know, the, the diversity of public service. Um, you know, diversity is not just demographic diversity, it's also um, educational diversity and economic diversity. Um, again, you know, people creating policies that affect the public need to reflect um, what members of the public are going through so they can understand the impact um, and also what's needed. Um, so, you know, again, it's something that we didn't really talk about at all today, but, you know, from a, from a participating and running for office side, um, as well as a serving um, in office and, and serving in civic position side, it is a, a very important part of the conversation. Well, I'll just share a joke that my dad keeps sending me these articles about how New York State is raising the salary for state legislators and how Illinois is, he's like, when is New Jersey going to raise the salary? Um, but yeah, it really varies from state to state. You know, some of them, it's more than 100,000. In New Jersey, it's 49,000 for state legislators. And I remember when I was mayor of my town, someone was arguing with me and they're like, you're just in it for the money. I'm like, how much do you think I make? And then, don't you make 150,000? And I was laughing because I used to get $5,000 as mayor of Montgomery Township. So, you know, it was basically a voluntary position because I know I spent more than that just on gas and, and things that I had to spend on expenses in that role. So we do have to think about, you know, how critical we are when we see those articles like lawmakers vote to give themselves a raise. Well, I, I had that attack at, about me, but it had just to raise it from 4,500 to 5,000 for the year. So, you know, we have to kind of keep things in perspective. And I think part of that will come from trying to have a healthier understanding of the elected official, that this is someone who is serving our community. Yes, there are bad actors. Those bad actors should be voted out. Those bad actors should be named and shamed. But the vast majority of people are in it for the right reasons. And, um, and, that is going to be a positive cycle because then more people will want to get involved. Um, so that that's just my comment on that. Awesome. Awesome. Oh. No, I said awesome. Sophie, you want to close this out? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you everyone for uh, coming today. Joe, you could probably close it out way better than I can. This, I'm a, this is my first time closing something out. I was, you did a fantastic job. I think it was great. I really appreciate all of you so much for your time and your insight and your service. Um, to those of you, as I said in the chat, to those of you who um, didn't get to ask your question or didn't have your question answered, I've copied and pasted those out of the chat. I will send them to the offices, the respective offices of our speakers today. Thank you again to Sophie so much. You will all be getting a recording as well as an auto transcript from today's event and, and an audio file that you can listen to and transcribe on your own if you want to. Um, I've included the email addresses uh, provided to us for the offices of uh, both Assemblywomen. Um, uh, Laura, did you have another email just you wanted me to send? I think I may have a Gmail for you and I wanted to make yeah, sure- Yeah, that... I'll send you my work email address. Okay, yeah, like just making sure. The... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it and um, have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. And uh, don't forget to check out the Diverse Sources database at diversesourcesnj.org where you can find experts and brilliant thinkers like these folks here uh, and so much more for your reporting. So thank you all again and have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks so Joe. much. Thanks, Take everyone. Bye-bye.